Welcome back to Icons, and today we have a very special guest, another voice from your childhood. She has voice acted in a number of major mainstream anime series, such as Detective Conan, One Piece, Full Metal Alchemist, and one of my favorites, Botan from Yu Yu Hakusho. But to us here in the Dragon Ball fandom, she is known as the wife of our hero, Chi Chi. Please welcome Cynthia Kranz. How are you, ma'am? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm from the South, so I'll be referring to you as ma'am. I hope that's okay. No, I'm a Southern girl. I went to Ole Miss. I live in Texas. It's great. You know what's funny about the character of Chi Chi, before we get into like the the whole thing with you, is you know it, this is kind of something that's lost in translation in every dub, whether it be the English, Spanish, French, but in the Japanese version, both the manga and the anime, Chi Chi is a country girl. Her and Goku are both from the country, so... If you were to like, if you were to do like a dub where you <laughs> took that piece of her character, right? She'd be like, right. right? She would be like, hey, Goku, how you doing, sugar? She would actually kind of be like that. It would sort of fit the character in a way. It would. In fact, Sabbath, when he was directing me, he was like, they're white trash. White <laughs> trash. And so that was the angle that he you know, gave to me for my inspiration of hardcore white trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because in Dragon Ball, like, it's supposed to be, it's not Asia. It's an, an alternate universe version of the world that has similar stuff to our world, but it's different. And yet there's, it's weird. It's, <laughs> but it makes sense what he said. Yes, it, so, it is. Was Dragon Ball your first foray into voice acting? Was that the first time you ever voice acted? Absolutely. So, what before you became a voice actress, uh, what would what'd you want to do as a kid? Like, what was your dream job? You know, um, going to the theater, musical theater is what got me excited. Going to see our local professional theater things when even the chorus was on stage, my hands would break out in sweat because I wanted to be up there. And then watching my sister compete in you know, um, the UIL competitions in theater got me going. And then in college, I realized when I was doing monologues in my room, just for fun, that maybe I should take some acting classes. <laughs> and then after college, I just started auditioning for community theater. And through that, someone told me, take classes, get pictures, make a resume, get an agent. And I'm lucky enough that Dallas is um, an area where you can be a working actor if your goal is not to be famous, but just to work professionally, and um, I'm very blessed to be in that situation. Right. It's better than living in the expensive California in some ways, right? Yeah. I never had the dream. I went to New York, and I was actually accepted into the American Academy of Dramatic. Ugh, the Amer anyway, my mother didn't want to – she was like, no – I don't want you to go there. And so I didn't pursue that, but I worked on a film in college as a stand in for a lead in a really bad movie called the gun and Betty Lou's handbag. And I was really turned off by the way the LA people treated each other. I didn't like that system. I've heard. So I was very happy to know that Dallas was, even though it's a commercial market and it's not glamorous that you can work professionally in every genre and get paid. So that was really kind of my goal. So you wanted to do not just voice acting uh, when you had first come to Dallas or when you first started doing this, but like doing stage stuff and like, you know, TV stuff and things like that. That was your ultimate goal? Like all like, right. you know, movies? Theater, theater gave me my high of performing in front of a live audience. Um, film was exciting, but, you know, I mean, the ones I did were not great. They were low budget. Commercials are boring, but they pay well industrial videos training videos there's every kind of you know thing you could i've been in um you know music videos i mean there's all kinds of genres where they you know they do um commercial print so just anything where i could make money doing this kind of thing that i you know thought was ethical you know and therefore i plan my career around that which is why i became a realtor because you have to have a flexible schedule to be able to go during business hours and audition and, you know, work during business hours. And Dallas is one of the few cities that's not on the coast that has a viable, um, you know, business where, you know, they need you. And they come here because we're a right-to-work state. And so it's cheaper for L.A. and New York to film here. 
And um, so there's some good opportunities. So what is it about performing that kind of drew you to it like when you were younger? Is it kind of like the ability to portray characters that are, you know, similar and or different than you? Is it like the thrill of getting the applause after doing a live show? Like what – just – Fill me in on what really drew you to being just an overall performer. Everything, I not just really, voice. I don't really know because I, I was shy. I was so shy that in fifth grade they put me in remedial reading because when we'd read aloud I would stutter because I was so nervous. And they didn't realize I was comprehending. So it wasn't about getting the attention. I think some actors just have a drive – to portray a character like an artist has to draw a character and for me it was you know I, mean, I was always a character actor in fifth grade I played an old woman I mean I went out and purposely in our play to be the old woman awesome. um, I don't know I that's an interesting question um, it's just why did I do monologues in my room by myself in college it was just I, I think it's just a calling, and you feel it, and you may not understand it. I never had any ideas of trying to be on television or be famous. It was just this need to perform in this genre. Yeah, No, it, it's like the beginning of Man on the Moon, the Andy Kaufman film, where he's a little kid, and he's talking into the wall. He's pretending he's on the Dick Clark show or whatever. And yeah. It, the same thing, right? You're, you're you're having like a monologue to yourself, like not saying that you're doing it like out of your imagination, but it's almost like you're you're rehearsing, right? Right. Like now weird... I would buy monologue books and practice them, but it didn't occur to me to sign up for freaking acting classes for a while, and then finally I'm like, well, I'm doing this for fun to amuse myself. Maybe I should take an acting class, and um, I was accepted. You had to audition to be accepted into the acting program, even though I was not an acting major. And so that was a thrill when they accepted me and allowed me to take the classes. And um, it's just something I felt and I wanted to do. It, it's not like, look at me, and it's not like I want to be famous. It was just like I have this need to, to perform, um, I guess, you know, like musicians or artists or whatever. Um, you just feel it, and you would do it for nothing, just for the thrill of doing it. That's when that's the best thing, right? When you, it's not really all about the money. It's it's it's, happy, no. it's happiness, right? Yeah. I did it for years for free. After work, you know, staying up late, and the, just the high of being on stage. And it wasn't even about that I'm getting attention. It's like we're all part of this thing, and we're creating this thing. And it, when it works, it's just magic. And when it doesn't, there's a challenge of fixing it on the fly. And um, so theater really was definitely the beginning. Um, and then I had to take – to be a professional actor, I had to take other classes – auditioning film um you know commercial acting because that's what dallas largely is and those are different skills and that became a different challenge and that dallas is largely a commercial market and so i took acting for commercials acting on camera acting on film and you know it, it's not the high that you get in theater or performing in a live audience but it it's its own thing and the whole process of being on a set or being in theater and doing the blocking, going through the auditions, I just really liked every part of the process, even if I didn't get a part. Well, I was going to ask you about that because before we get to Dragon Ball, which we're going to get to here in a minute, you know, a lot of voice actors who I've spoken to or who I've seen do interviews, they often say that to be a great voice actor, you have to be a great actor. They say take acting classes. Even if you never intend to be on camera, right. it helps. Do you, you, I, I guess you would agree with that, right? Well, 100% because – um, you, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say there aren't exceptions of people that just are great at voices and, you know, some people don't need classes. Julia Roberts didn't study. She just was discovered. I mean, there's people like that, but, um, it is a craft and a skill and it's something you can learn and get better at. And I took probably 10 years worth of workshops from different studios in Dallas or people that would come through from New York and, 
just try to improve and you can learn. You learn and you get better. And, and, um, that's what's, that to me is what's exciting is you learn a new technique. You know, I'm not a method actor. I can't like well up tears, but if I can learn to listen and be in the moment, but yeah, I mean, if you can't act, your voice is, you know, it's great to have a good voice and be able to mimic, but I feel like to authentically do it, you need to be able to act. And then on top of that, learn the, you know, if we're doing dubs, flat map matching is a whole different, that was a whole different change in the ball game. Um, because before that, I'd never had to ma- match flaps. So that was interesting in its own thing because you can be a great actor, but if you can't match flaps, you can't do anime. Yeah, I guess the director helped you out with that, right? I don't. The ADR director. Well, I mean, yeah, they did, but, you know, I mean, Sabbath was my first director. Dragon Ball Z was the first show. I'd never done it. We were doing it on VHSs. I, you know, and they're like, and back then they didn't show it to you on VHS first. I mean, they didn't say, here it is in Japanese. They would go look at line 22, and it was not on a screen in the computer. It was on a paper, and you look at line 22, and you'd hear three beeps, and on what would be the fourth beep, you start talking and hope that it matches up and you haven't seen what the character's facial expressions are. And, you know, now it's, they've gotten better at realizing let's play the Japanese and let's see is she, when it says, you know, um, concerned scream, is she screaming like crazy or is she just mildly concerned? What's her facial expression? What's the tone? And you can time it out in your head while you're looking at the line. And then then all of a sudden, boom, you've got to go and try to memorize that line and sync it up at the same time. So it's as much acting as it is that other skill, which is so weird <laughs> that no other acting job requires. <laughs> right. It, it, it's, it's acting and ex, ex, like extreme timing, I guess. It would and it be, is. Right? And there's no... There's no more bizarre, like the opposite of the way we talk is how Japanese cadence is. Like they don't pause at punctuation. They don't stop for traumatic pauses and be like, ah, you know, love it. Or, you know, I mean, they're just like, I love it. And I mean, you have to be able to say it in a way that matches the flaps, but somehow sounds natural. And it's, it. and for me, that's a challenge that I love about it because Sometimes you'll mix up words, but it's a happy accident and it works better. Sometimes you feel like an idiot because you just can't do it and it sounds awkward every time you say it. Um, It's a hard skill, but I definitely think, going back to your question, you have to have the acting chops so you don't have to think about the acting when you're having to dub things because they don't give you a lot of backstory. Like... Unless it's something like Dragon Ball Z, which I've done for 19 years, if, say, Funimation will call and say, you know, Mike needs you on Tuesday at 2, I'll show up and I don't know what the show is. I don't know what my part is. He'll be like, here it is in Japanese. And I'll see a little (laughs) scene. And then they're like, you know, I'm like some, you know, saleswoman. In one day, I've been a, a, a demon a nun, a vampire, a hooker, and a little girl. I mean, you know, they just send you around and you do bit parts. I mean, you do not know what you're going to do, and you just have to look at it and make a decision and hope it works. <laughs> they don't even tell you ahead of time what show you're going to no. do, so you can't even research no, it? No, the talent coordinator <laughs> literally says, Tina and Jerry and, you know, um, Mike need you on Tuesday from 2 to 4. Are you available? And you say yes. And I don't know what show they're doing. And if I do, I don't know what it means. And my character may or may not have a name. It may or may not be a recurring character. It may be in the middle of the series. I have no idea what's going on. They go, okay, well, right now, you know, they're being invaded. And, you know, you're the teacher, um, you know, you're the, you know, headmaster of this school. And here it is in Japanese. And they show you the scene and you, try to look at your lines and watch the scene at the same time. They're like, okay, you ready? Okay. And then you get your beeps and you talk and you just pray to, you know, the universe that you can sync it up and act. (laughs) (laughs) And your voice comes out because there's, there's a weird thing probably 
everybody experiences but doesn't talk about, which is the awkward read, which is, in my mind, I'm going to say it this way, but when it comes out of my mouth, it's, I have an awkward inflection on the wrong word. <laughs> Stuff like we that. all do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do that too. When I record, <laughs> it, it's just, it's a, it's a mental. <laughs> it's thing. like, that's not how it was in my head. Why can I control <laughs> that? But, or, or you'll see the words, but you might skip a word or flip flop words or add a word. It's just, it's an odd genre. There's nothing like it. And I absolutely adore the challenge of that. It's like your brain pauses for a second. Oh, I'm not even sure if it pauses. Right. It just makes a executive decision without consulting you and stuff comes out of your mouth. <laughs> well, that's always bad. Uh, but luckily we have alt- alternate takes you know we can always Sometimes go to. it's not bad. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was doing a video game for Dragon Ball Super and I did that and um, the script coordinator, Terry Doty, was like, no, that's actually better. You know what Chi Chi sounds like. You know what she would say. It did fit the mouth flat or the time period, so we like that better. And because I kept apologizing, I'm like, I don't know why I'm skipping this word and saying this word. And she's like, obviously that's how your character. I mean, she's like, that was a happy accident. And so sometimes there is that, and then there's sometimes you do it 80 times and know that you're like killing your director <laughs> and maybe never going to work again if you can't say it right. So. Well, if anybody if anybody knows that character, it's you because, like you said, nineteen years. You know, I can't believe it, and I've mourned the death of her like four times. Right. Well, let's go back for just a minute here. Let's go back to nineteen ninety nine. I want to give real quick the people some a quick you know, kind of backstory before I get to my question. Just real quick. So you come into Funimation in ninety nine uh, for to begin dubbing season three of Dragon Ball Z. Essentially, you're taking over for Lara Sadiq from the Ocean yeah. Dub. Uh, from Vancouver, yeah, because they decided when they when when Funimation when when Dragon Ball Z blew up on television, uh, more episodes were demanded, so they went back and they did it. But they chose to go with an in-house cast in Texas, and that's where you came yeah. in. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that. How did you find out about the audition? Like, how did you end up there auditioning for this character? And was this the character that you originally wanted to audition for? Well, how did that whole thing happen? Okay, the first it's time? kind of random. Um, there was a a, a cable show that we did that was a comedy sketch show. And one of my friends that worked on it also worked at the Dallas Observer, which is like the hip newspaper in Dallas. And they had put an open call. I had an agent, but I didn't get it through my agent. This My friend called and goes, oh, my God, I've just placed an open casting call for this new cartoon that's coming out. You have to go. And I went, okay. And he knew I wasn't going to go. So he called me again and he goes, you really need to go and do this. I'm like, sure. And hung up and thought, I've never done cartoons. What the hell? I'm not going to get this. And then he called a third time and said, you really need to go. And I said, okay. And I called and I heard Sabbath's voice on the outgoing message and thought, is this for real? Because I'd never heard a voice like that before. And anyway, they called me in. And they had all the female characters, and they put me in a booth and let me hear each character and gave me the script. And then my job was try to, um, you know, voice those characters, match the characters. So they, they let you listen to the previous voice actor? Yes, and then redo gotcha. that scene okay. and try to match them. And so it wasn't gotcha. – and the ironic thing is in the – you know, I, I, was, I didn't care. I'd be happy with any of them. But um, I do remember Chi Chi's, and it was nothing about yelling or being bossy. It was like, oh, oh, boys will be boys. And she was being very motherly and wifey. And um, how did they know I I was going to be able to scream and yell and be crazy? Because none of the stuff I auditioned for is anything she ever says. (laughs) But... It's funny because that boys to be boys line. I think I know exactly what scene that was too. That's, that, that's She's crazy. doing the dishes. She's I like, mm, "Boys to be boys," which she never says in any other scene. So I did all that, and it was fun, and I hoped I got it. And I didn't hear anything. And then on my thirtieth birthday, I checked my. This is how old it was. Um, nineteen ninety nine answering machine, and I had Chris up going, "You've been cast as the voice of Chi Chi," and I went running around my apartment just elated because I thought I didn't have a chance. So, and then I, 
what he didn't tell me was awesome. your character didn't come up for like many episodes. So like That's right. <laughs> every month I would be like, I'd call him and go, did I make up that I got cast? <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you got the part. I'm like, okay. And then like, cause usually when you're cast, you immediately start a project. I'm like, well, okay. I just, I feel really silly, but did, did I really get the part? He's like, yeah. So three months later I started and, um, it was back in the day where they had a TV screen on the other side of the whisper booth in a VHS and then have to rewind in between everything. And it was paper scripts. I mean, it was, um, way different. Archaic. Archaic. Right. Yes. But I remember thinking I'm doing a cartoon and if no one ever sees it, this can never be taken away from me. I've never done a cartoon before. You know, I'd done every other genre and this was super exciting to me. So what did they tell you about the character? Like what, how did you learn about the character? Did they make you go back and kind of watch the old stuff no. uh, or did they give you like a piece of paper? Yeah. I know Brian Drummond told me that when he first auditioned for Vegeta, they gave him like a piece of paper that said, you know, he's a prince, he's this, he's that. Did you get any of that? No, no, no. I just knew I was a mom and a wife. And then Chris was like, I don't even know how far into it because I had to learn how to dub um, he was like, no, I mean, like she's redneck, she's rough, she's white trash. So, you know, and then when you, you know, back then they didn't show you the Japanese version. You couldn't see what the character's facial expressions were. So I didn't know she was coming completely unglued. I had to guess it when it said, you know, irritated yell, you know, well, how irritated is she screaming with bubbles coming out of her head now that I know that happens or was she just bitching? And so, um, I had to rely on him and trust him and he guided me through that and was just like, no, she's really rough. <laughs> well, that's the thing I was going to ask you. Did they tell you that the character of Chi Chi at one time was a tough martial artist, you know, when she had no. first gotten, I you know you, you, you went back and you didn't know any of that stuff. You no. just went in like, whatever, no. we'll figure it out. Cause you caught on pretty quick. I had no idea about anything about anything. And that's the thing. It's not like a play where you can read it and then make up your character's backstory or it's a film and you know the backstory. It was just like, okay, these are my lines. <laughs> I'm a mom and a wife. Here's what I'm saying with some weird direction saying, you know, um, awkward, you know, questioning, react. I mean, I didn't know. The weirdest thing was the reactions. Like, huh? you know, I mean. Because, you know, would say inhale and I'd be like, <gasps> and they'd be like, no, you need to exhale. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> I think you said inhale. Yeah, it said, it, or, or I can't, I don't, can't think of the word of <gasps> that noise, but that's what yes. I would think in my head. But really what they wanted was, <sighs> and so the reacts were weird and the fight, you know, any kind of action noise was very strange. No one teaches you that in any acting class <laughs> of any kind. It's it's almost like you had to relearn everything in, in a way, not everything. Not but, relearn. You know, I had to learn a whole new thing that I never knew existed. I'm like, what's a fight yell? Like, what's a jumping sound? What's a you know landing sound? I, I I didn't know, so it was all brand new and just like I I was so nervous at everything, just like oh, what am I doing? And it took years, probably four or five or six years before they started showing us the Japanese version and then letting us do it. And it's not that we're copying them, but we get to see how intense is the voice. What does the face yeah. look like? What's the body? Because directors like Chris Bevins, if you're working for him, he would say, Cynthia, if I wasn't getting the line right, he'd be, go, look at me. And I'd look out the window and he'd go, make this face when you say the line and for some reason, making that face when I said the line would work. And so, but what that translates to is getting to see the Japanese version. You're not copying them, but you get to see what the character is doing and then put what you think goes with that. And we didn't have that benefit for many, many years. Yeah, and I, I've talked about that before because a, a lot of times that old Dragon Ball Z dub does get scrutinized, and rightfully so in some cases, yes. but I feel like the... The wrong people get blamed for it. It wasn't that, you know, <laughs> Sabbat and, and like, well, I mean, it wasn't that, that the voice actors were, were, were not like, 
you know, that they didn't know what they were doing. It was more so that you didn't have the tools, and now you have the tools. You know, digital age, you can watch Super all the way until, you know, way ahead of when your lines were even recorded and figure out everything now. It's so much easier. Yeah, and I was so dumb. I didn't even, you know, when auditions, they don't audition me anymore because they have a voice bank, and so they think they know everything I can do, which I probably need to send them a demo of new things they've never heard, but... Right. In any case, had I known about, we, I didn't know what Wikipedia was. So I didn't know I could look up a show, see it in Japanese and think, oh, I'd be good at this or that, or this is what the, I mean, you show up, there's a binder, it says female or male, and there's a picture of the character, a quick paragraph describing it in five lines. And so, yep. I mean, that's not a lot of information, but you know, had I known about Wikipedia and how I could have gone and researched the shows and seen, oh, okay, um, that would have made a, a pretty big difference. But I can't complain. I've, I've had some awesome roles on some awesome shows, and I give so much credit to the directors because we're flying blind, and they have to tell us and show us and guide us, and that's what I rely on. Right. Well, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Cause I have a question about that. I wanted to ask you. So, Dragon Ball Z blows up. Funimation starts making real money. Uh, at one time, Funimation was in deep trouble in the mid '90s. Not so much because they were, you know, and, and not financially, but you know, they weren't producing what they they're not what they are now. And that's what I was going to get to. So, after Dragon Ball Z got big, Funimation got the authority or whatever you want to call it, the licensing to dub. Several other shows, you know, GT would come along, Dragon Ball would come along, tons more episodes for you to do. Then they start dubbing other anime like Fruits, Baskets, and Yu Yu Hakusho. Mm -hmm. So at the time, and, and because you were part of that, see, that's the thing that people don't understand is because you were part of that original Season 3 cast, the, the Texas Season 3 cast, they, they went to you, I suppose quicker i don't know what the word is but you were kind of part of like a, a sort of a big boom in the anime scene and as a result of that they got more anime so now that there's all these new anime coming in funimation's got a lot of work to do at this point are you thinking okay there's lots of work for me now i can keep doing this and make it into a career is that what was going through your head during that time in 99 2000 2001 not really um i I was thrilled that there were only about three or four girls. I mean, there were just, there were so few girls doing it. And I don't know that I would have gotten any of the other roles had it, it not been for that fact. Um, you know, Yu Yu Hakusho came along. I mean, first of all, I have to say, I'm a little annoyed that they never gave me the chance to play young Chi Chi. I could have made my voice younger. I played a younger girl in Negama and some other shows. They just cast Laura Bailey. They never never even let me. And I'm not nothing against her. She's awesome as a person and actress, but I didn't even get to audition for young Chi Chi. So yeah. um, that's irritating. I didn't even know that was happening. But but I'm grateful that because there weren't a lot of girls, I got to audition for Yu Yu, and that reminded me of, as we've talked about, a film Spielberg did called Always, where Audrey Hepburn played essentially – the same kind of character Botan is, which is a happy, perky, grim reaper that, you know, is, isn't is scary. She greets Richard Dreyfus after he's dead. He doesn't know he's dead. And she gives him a haircut and tells him, well, you know, he's like, oh, unless I didn't survive it, unless I'm dreaming. She's like, well, you're not dreaming. And so that was my inspiration hmm. for that. And I really did want that. And then when Case Close came, that was my next big thing. And I really was excited. I loved um, Butters on, um, oh my God, the show, the show, South Park. Butters. South Park, yeah. You know, I wasn't Butters, trying yeah. to imitate anyone, but Butters is the nerdy, geeky one. And, you know, that was who was in my head. And so, you know, I was thrilled. Now I was you were Mitch. For Mitch, yes, in case yeah. closed. Um, but Butters was my inspiration for Mitch. And I don't try to imitate, but that's who I get my inspirations from. And, you know, I honestly think the lack of competition contributed to my getting some of these other big shows. And I got spoiled because these big shows were long year, years yep. and years of work. Yep. And um, yeah. it's not that way anymore. Um, but, yeah, it got to a point where I was turning down Wallace Sessions, which is with 
everyone and which are really fun. That's when you get to hear other people do their things. You get to try out, be a demon, be a hooker, be a nun. But I was like, oh, no, I don't want to come in for that. You know, I didn't realize that, oh, the new kids are coming and you need and it pays the same and you can learn a lot. And um, I got a little lackadaisical about that. And then, you know, all of a sudden it becomes a thing and new people realize they want to be voice actors. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for everything I've done. And, and I've been kind of um, typecast as the mom. There's something in my voice that they think, it, which is ironic because I'm not a mom, <laughs> but yeah. it was, I was one of the older ones. I was 30 when they were in their twenties. And so they said, there's a quality of warmth in your voice. And so if I'm not the mom, I'm the mom character, the big sister, the mistress, headmistress of the school, the nurse, that kind of thing. And, and that's great. Whatever gets me in is great, but it, it has been nice on the few occasions I've been able to play other characters outside that range. And then there came a time in the last few years when I wasn't getting called in at all. And I was like, Oh my gosh, am I done? You know, and then, I hope not. Well, I mean, and I'm not, I've come back and I've done some other things. Right. Have some new I'm saying that's what I would be thinking at the time. Yeah, I know. I mean, I right. feel like it's been eight months, you know, literally six, eight months. I have not been called in. What did I do wrong? You know, and I get that they need to rotate people, and I get that, and I understand, you know, I'm not, it's not about me, but I would have liked the opportunity to try, but there's there have been some amazing roles. I loved, you know, in Princess Jellyfish, Chieko, you know, and I loved right. playing Coach Mo and Big Windup, and my husband is a huge baseball fan, and all this character's lines were mental, like, oh, you can do, what are you doing? Well, I've lived 15 years with a man saying the things she was thinking. So that was a fun role. That helped. Oh, my gosh. It was nothing. Right. I just, I know things I shouldn't know about baseball, and it just was, I know what, and you know, I know what she was thinking based on what he says when he's watching the Rangers. So, some of those were great, and Terry Doty gave me a role in Ride Back where I play, as she put it, kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so okay, Yoda. nice to get to play outside the character, but I'm also not ever going to poo-poo the mom thing because Bellamere's a mom character, and, you know. Um, well, you also played Bulma's mother. Oh, yes. I love that. That was hysterical. Um, she just seemed very Betty Boopy, Marilyn Monroe to me. And I wish very there flirtatious. Was, I really wish there was more of her because she's so just shallow and sweet and just, you know, she, she's the off. She's the anti Gigi, you know, she's <laughs> um, so I mean, that's a gift. Anything I do is a gift and I'm grateful, but I've learned not to take it for granted because you know, there's a part of me after 19 years going, it's the new kids and I'm old hat. And, you know, now I've got some good stuff going, but there was a time when I'm like, am I ever going to work again? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a scary, I guess, time, it right? Cause, cause then like, it's like, well, I know I'm doing yeah. the job right because they allot so many lines per hour. And if you're done early, that means you, you got everything done before you were supposed to. So I'm like, well, I, think I'm doing everything right because I'm always finished early but I'm also thinking there's probably other things I could do that they don't know I could do and I probably need to make a demo but I don't really have the time or money right now to put it into it and come up with voices they've never heard and then new people that don't know me start directing and so I've marketed I mean I've sent out you know gift cards to Starbucks I've sent out greeting cards with my resume for the new kids that grew up watching me, but maybe didn't know all the things I did besides I love Chi Chi, but I don't want to be defined by it because I can do right. other things. So, yeah. um, it's kind of, no, I mean, Bol Bolton's a very different character, I would say, I, but I feel like Chi Chi, I think the reason why Chi Chi resonates is because Bolton, like you said, is more of a fantastical character. Whereas, Chi Chi's kind of realistic, you know. You, I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about the connection, like as you were playing this character. No, I'm just curious. Did did anything resonate with her struggles as a mother, wife, whatever? Yeah, I mean, not not as a mother because you're not a mother, but you know. No, what I mean. but like but 
okay, I have animals, and I know they're not right. human, but it's just like, no, you're not doing that. No, you are not running off in the neighbor's yard. You're coming here. You're getting in your house. Get in it. I mean, and I know how I was raised. Um, I just get that she's no nonsense. She doesn't realize that saving the world is more important. You know, she's like, oh, that's fantasy. Come on. He needs to have something steady like a lawyer or a doctor. But also, she's frustrated. Her husband is never home. And her right. son and her husband disappear like that with no warning. And she's frustrated. She's worried. She loves them so much. But she gets so mad because she she's passionate. She's passionately, oh, my baby. She's passionately, ah, you know, because I said so. She's passionately, no, you did not do that. You know, whatever it is, it's 100%. And so that's what I think about her. What she feels, everything, and it's whatever direction it's going in, it's 100%. Whether it's love, laughter, anger, sadness, frustration. And so I can resonate with that. And my husband's like, I wish you were more Botan and less Chi Chi in real life. <laughs> <laughs> like me too. He actually said that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of awesome. Yes, because I, I'm a passionate person and we've got a great relationship. But I'm like, I worked for a Greek family in a Greek restaurant where you're just like, yeah, you know, you're yelling at each other through the window, or, you know. They literally, while customers are in the restaurant, are yelling between the window, between the kitchen and the thing. And I eventually turned into that. And that's very chi-chi. It's just like you're just so passionate about whatever's happening at that moment. Like literally I was taking an order and my boss was like, ding, 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 the order's up. And I'm like, yeah, I'm taking an order. Ding, ding. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm taking an order. Do you just want me to leave him? You know, or do you know what? What? What do you want me to do? And um, that's very Chi Chi. She's just very literal and she's very passionate. And so that resonates for me. I wish I was more like Botan because she's so hot and sexy and sweet, you know, and hopefully I have some of those qualities sometimes, but I'm probably a lot more Chi Chi than I don't yell all the time, but I have embarrassed myself with my husband by being very unattractively chi chi <laughs> about her you, you know I, I, I feel like the, when it comes to chi chi right because a lot of a lot of fans have you know shown that they don't like chi chi in dragon ball super because she's like she becomes kind of irrational like you said earlier she knows that goku and gohan these characters are important to save you know the universe and whatnot but she wants them for herself but i've always in my head just thought that she's fed up with it i mean how many years you know did this woman have to endure and it's not even her fault like it's not her fault that goku's brother shows up out of nowhere it's not her fault right. that some scientists create death machines she's just trying <laughs> to raise a kid and there's all these things stopping her you know it, it's it, i think people give her a bad rap as far as that goes <laughs> because the world of dragon ball we don't deal with those problems in our world no no, I mean, she's not part of the world of Dragon Ball. She quit competing. She married. She had her family. And it's kind of like the the sweet square teacher that marries a rock star and is pissed off. Yeah. Stop touring. And why don't you change and have a normal job? You know? And um, uh, Right. Yeah, she's just being all like, I want you home and safe. And I want you to have a good, steady job. And she, it's for the best of intentions. And also, you got to remember, she's a grandmother now. She's got pan. And, you know, I mean, she's she's just, she. all that matters to her is her family and their well-being. So she's not concerned about the battles unless she's there cheering them on. Other than that, she's worried sick. You know, she's mad because she's abandoned all the time for these things with no warning. And worried to death, are they going to survive it? And um, doing the best she can to hold down the fort. That's how I look at her. She's seen a lot of people die in her life, too. Yes. You know, and that's another thing. Yes, she has. And she doesn't get to fight anymore, either. So maybe there's a little bit of jealousy that she doesn't get to be in those tournaments. 
That's right. That, well, I mean, they they got married, or they, I, I'm sorry, engaged. They got engaged in one. So I know. So you know, and you know, there's a part over there's like, yeah, but that's over for her, so she thinks it should be over for them, and it's all the right. family. So she's just the naggy mom wife. But she has good intention. She's well intended, but she has no problem expressing her opinions to get what she wants. Exactly. Now I I got some questions from some Chi Chi fans. I want to give a shout out to Kawhi Ray, Vengeful Boy, Shadow A Taurus, and Kyrie Aju. <laughs> they sent me some questions. Now we already answered a couple of these. Uh, we already asked about your connection to Chi Chi and what you learned about the character, and we already talked about how you got the role. But Vengeful Boy has a great question. I pretty much have asked this to everybody, so I'm going to ask you as well. Okay. Did you feel like did you feel like you portrayed a different character in the original dub versus the Kai dub? Because everyone I talked to says that the Kai dub was so much easier to do and so much more fun because it was oh, more yeah. based on the Japanese, better technology. So what was your experience with the two different dubs? Totally. Because by then we knew how to dub. And we knew who our character was. The first times we were speaking those lines, we didn't know anything about these characters. So by now, I know her. I can become her at the snap of a finger. And I get why she is the way she is. And yes, technology, we're no longer on VHS, you know. And we can see the Japanese. And they've cut out the fluff, which actually, for me, sucked. Because my part usually is the fluff. But uh, right. but it was fun to redo a scene and get to do it better, you know, get to go, okay, now I know what's going on and I get to do the scene the way I really think it should be done. So it was a- – And you, you, can do, you can do it in order because before you didn't do it in order. It was all out of order. Yeah, I didn't even know that. I mean <laughs> it's so <laughs> random. You don't know. I mean because she's sporadic, so I'm not there every week with her. Like in Shin Shan, Mitzi was there every week. I knew what was going on all the time. Uh, same with Botan. But with Mitzi, I mean, excuse me, Chi Chi, it could be months between stuff, which made it harder to learn to dub, made it harder to learn to character. So, yes, by the time Kai came along, I had an idea of what I was doing, and it was it was fun to get to do it, get a redo. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, get a, get a, get a redo, get to do it better. And I remember the scene, and they may have written it differently, and so that was really, really fun. Super is hysterical because of all the new characters they've added, and I love that. No, and the stuff with Chi-Chi and Super has been pretty great, too, especially the... uh the episodes, it's already aired. You probably did it months ago. Well, actually, I know you did it months ago. The um, the the her wanting to like mother Pan a lot, even though it's her oh, grandmother. Oh, I love or, that. And the the yeah. one where they're doing the cabbage, they're they're doing the cabbage contest. The picking. Yeah. I mean yeah. that, and it wasn't even my part that I thought was hysterical. It was watching them like you know, <laughs> Chris and Schimmel, <laughs> you know, do the cabbage thing and um. You know, I mean, it was hysterical. Raleigh's really fun. He'll show you funny things. If we're good, doing good on time, he'll show you some other scenes and uh, other people's stuff. Usually I'm the first one to record. I'm not sure why, but so I don't often get to see other people's stuff until it comes out. Well, now all you got to do is have Crunchyroll, and you can go – well, I mean, not their stuff, but, I mean, you can watch right. it. Like I was saying earlier, yeah, you just watch ahead of Right, time but when I go out. to record, I'm just – usually there's nothing to react to. Sometimes there's no sound or effects even. It's just me talking. So uh, it's interesting to see it when it comes out and hear what everybody else did because what I love about that show is all the characters, even like just a random fan in a tournament, are hysterical. They have, you know, they just, it's funny. It's a funny, funny show, and I love that. No, I think the slice of life stuff, um, like the in-between the big arcs, has been the best part of Super. I mean, there's a really great episode coming up uh, that you haven't gotten to yet because it's at the end of this arc where it's a baseball episode where literally you have these characters who are, you know, super powered beyond, like universe-busting characters playing baseball. Oh, my gosh, I can't wait. Oh, you're. That's a good one. Am I that in that a, one? A, are you sure I'm in that yes. one? Okay. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Everyone's in that one. Everyone's in that one. Oh, 
pretty. No, that's great. I'm excited. No, it's just, and I can't believe it. I mean, I've mourned the the death of the characters and the end of the show so many times. When they came back and told me two years ago, almost three now, that Super was going to happen, I just was like elated like I was the first time I got cast. I'm like, you are kidding me. This cannot be real. <laughs> But 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 now it's ending and we're gonna get a movie and maybe it'll come back next year. Is so maybe. now I thought we had more episodes. Well, the Japanese run is gonna be ending. We're by the way, I should tell people we're recording this weeks before it actually you will actually hear it. But uh, yes, it's ending uh, the end of March. March will be the final episode one thirty one, oh and then we yeah it sucks. I know. Then we're off I until that. the movie. Thanks. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> and and then the, there's going to be a movie coming out in um, December, theatrical. I don't know if you get paid more for those, but that's no, good. No, you get the I, same. The video games pay more. The movie was funny, Bow the Gods, because I literally recorded two hours. Two hours. And so they had a premiere, and I took my husband, and we walked the red carpet, and people asked us questions and took pictures. And then we went in, and I'm watching the movie. I'm like, oh, here's my – oh, well, I know I said something there. Okay. Well, here I – oh, no. And so basically the it's the, you know, stereo, stereotypical cutting room floor. Um, three – Two hours of acting turned into literally three lines, and I was so humiliated. I just crawled out of the theater. I was like, get the car. Get the car. Let's go now. I'm embarrassed that I walked the freaking red carpet for three, for basically what was an extra role. You know, after I recorded two hours, which is 60 lines usually, you know, and it got cut down to three, but it was just funny. So I don't know if I'll be in the movie, but um, I'm grateful for anything there is. I'm didn't know we were coming to an end that soon, but I appreciate the heads up, so I won't be devastated when I get to record it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but uh, it's. I do have some, something to ask you about when it comes to what you just said, though. Those 60 lines, did they? so they didn't tell you. This is interesting. They did not tell you that there's an extended cut of Battle of Gods and that the majority of those lines that you cut we're probably in the extended cut. No, they don't that's, tell that's on the us Blu-ray. anything. They don't tell us. Jeez. They don't yeah. Tell you when you're gonna die. In fact, we think that they secretly love to watch you get to the line where they're like, "I'm turning you into an egg and stepping on you." You're like, "Wait, what? What? Yeah, you die." In the you know, like what? What? <laughs> I mean, they don't go. You're today. You're gonna die. Or I mean, they just let you get you know an hour into the session and then you die, and they let you. I think they secretly enjoy watching you have to process that you get attached to the character and the show. Plus, it's your job and income have to process that and then do it on the fly. (laughs) So uh, just like it is when they call you in for a new role in a new show and you don't know what it is, if you're a one day character or if you're a regular, you have no idea who you are or what you're doing. So that's what keeps it interesting, always. Well, um, we'll talk more about that later because I have I'm gonna have some information for you. But that being said, uh, yeah, it's it's I'm pretty sure those extra lines that you that you said were probably in the extended version <laughs> of the Blu-ray and not in the theatrical. That's what I'm getting. No, at. but it was just you know I was so excited. I'm like, oh, two hours. I'm I'm all through this and. It was my first premiere of the first show I've ever done that's in a movie, and they're having people there and pictures taken, and my husband with me, and so proud. And then I'm just like, cut, 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 cut. I'm like, dude, let's go before the line. <laughs> like, let's get the car. I'm embarrassed that I made such a big deal and <laughs> took pictures and signed autographs, and I said three lines. Can we please just go? <laughs> hey, whatever. It's just fu- <laughs> now it's funny. I was literally crying on the way out because I was embarrassed. You know, it wasn't my feelings weren't hurt. I knew it wasn't personal. But I was like, I'm so embarrassed. We drove all the way out here and big to do. And, you know, out of the 60 lines I did, there were three. Of- I might as well not have been here. <laughs> it's just. It's well, I'm. Um, I- it, was it? Well, did you enjoy the movie at least? I don't yes, know. Yes, <laughs> I loved the movie. I did. 
I was very proud of the movie. So it's not all about me. I was just like, oh, I feel so stupid for walking a red carpet for three lines. I want to slink away. Um, but no, um, I was very proud of the movie. I actually liked it. I didn't know I was going to like it that much. I wasn't in the next one, and I don't know if I'll be in this next one you're talking about. We'll see. Well, it's going to be interesting, very, very interesting, because uh, by my calculations, if they don't take a, a break when they're airing it on television, the movie will be out in Japan December, and if they do a dub for this movie, which you know they will do, if it comes out by next summer here, like in North America, let's say it comes out like by summer of 2019, the super run will not be over, so it's going to be weird because we may get, and Japan's going to get the movie after Super ends. So if the ending of Super impacts this movie, storyline-wise, it's going to make sense to them. But if, if Funimation or Fox, who distributes the movie, if they put it out next summer, let's just say, or maybe even earlier than that, um, it's going to be weird for the fans if they're going to watch a story that... They're not going to understand, they may not understand, because Super is not going to end the dub until roughly around November of 2019, if they don't Okay, get break, okay, so. you make me feel better by 2019, because I thought you were saying it was ending in March. I'm like, wait, I thought we were just in the 40s on what we've been doing, or 60s. Well, you're... You're in the 40s, but the well, in the 50s now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, think, that's making me feel yeah. better. So that makes more sense. Japan's finishing up. We're a year behind. Ish. Yes, you're about a year behind. Yeah, okay. yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Because you're a year yes. behind, the movies tend to come faster. So is this movie going to come out before Super even gets the hearing? No, it's weird. I have no idea, and I didn't know that Super was going to be based around explaining what happened in Battle of the Gods. So. I really don't know. I know nothing. I know that I am called upon to come when they need me. <laughs> I get in the box, right. I say my words, and I leave. <laughs> and hope that it doesn't get cut. <laughs> I, do ha I do have some good news for you, though. They did tease a Yu Yu Hakusho special. So what? you might get to portray Botan again if, the if Funimation gets the rights to it. Oh, that would be dreamy. So be I have fun. a convention with Justin Cook in March, and I'm going to totally question him about that because i i that show that's after when i go to conventions after chi chi botan is the next most popular character so and the, it was just yeah. a fun show and there were so many great characters um so that would be a dream come true my real dream would be if they would bring back shin shin which really upset me because i was told we could continue doing this, but we're having such a problem between the Japanese sense of humor and the American sense of humor yeah, that we're just tired sure. of doing it. Yeah. And I'm like, what? This is my life. This is my favorite show. This is, oh my gosh, you mean you could, but you're choosing not to? And, oh, I just couldn't wrap my brain around that one. Like, don't tell me you could. I didn't need to know that you could. Now that I know you could, but you chose not to because it's too much of a pain, is really not resonating well with me because I love that show. I think it might still be airing in Japan. I have to check on that because it's got like over 800 episodes. That, that's one of the oldest shows. And it's one of the funniest. I mean, it's the one yeah, where you is. have to pause it and go, did they really just say that? I mean, no, like... it's... it's... <laughs> Actually, I'm checking right now, and it says here 92 to present, so it is still airing. Oh, so yeah, it, and I'm just mad yeah. that the Japanese and Americans couldn't work it out, that they were like, the Japanese were offended at things like female hygiene. There's one episode where Mitzi hears that they're selling irregular tampons on sale, and she's like, irregular? That's me! And they were offended <laughs> and horrified, but yet they can show panties and blood and beer with little kids, and so... You know, I'm just like, why can't y'all just, uh, come on. Why can't we all just, you know, smile on your brother. Everybody get along. What the fuck? Excuse me. Right. But, um, no, it's okay. yeah, I mean that, that I love that show. And it's, it's interesting what does or doesn't. So many people loved princess jellyfish, but I guess it didn't sell well in case closed. Detective Conan was too violent for little kids and too immature for big kids, so they didn't know what to do with that. And that's too bad. It's a great show too. You know, I loved I love them all for all different reasons, but it is interesting what makes something decide. I mean, 
whether or not even emotionally attached to the decision, it's interesting what decides if it goes on or does not. And um, right. And I got spoiled with the really long shows, like you know, One Piece is still going and all this, but you know, these little ones are just thirteen or twenty six episodes, and they're done, and you're just like, I. Um, it's the, it's interesting. I really didn't think anime would become a thing and last this long. So I'm just grateful that it still is a thing. Oh yeah. Well, it's, I don't know if it'll ever end. I hope it doesn't. (laughs) I hope it doesn't. I just, um, I just, it, it amazes me that people are like, how do you become a voice actor? And I'm like, just be an actor. I mean, I didn't even know this, what it was. I had no idea what anime was. None. And after I got cast, I happened to be at a friend's house and they had cable, which I didn't, which is embarrassing. And I saw an episode and I go, I think this is the show I'm going to be doing. And it was one where Gohan plucks an apple off of a tree and starts tripping. And I'm like, oh. that, that That's one of the movies, actually. That's the first movie. Well, yep. I was. That is the first movie. Well, you know, it just looked all very weird. And, like, I was like, what if I, like, what is this devil show I've signed up for? <laughs> you know, um, that was the first thing I saw. I'm like, what? Oh, my gosh. I just agreed to it. I don't even know what the content is. <laughs> well, it was funny because in that scene, you know, he, the, the, he eats the apple. Yes. And they say, don't eat it. It gets you drunk. But in the censored dub, the one that aired back then, he's like, it makes you act funny. But you could tell he was drunk because they had, like, the, the bloodshot eyes. You know what I'm talking about? He was like, totally like, you could tripping, tell. and he had a tail. And I'm like, what have I signed up on? I just got news I received it. I hadn't recorded a thing. And I'm like, I think this is my show. Everybody look. And everybody's like, oh, wow. Well, okay. <laughs> what are you going to be doing? <laughs> So Japan. Um, it's come it's a Japan. long way. It's come a long way, and I hope it continues. It's it's Japan. Now, um, one more Chi-Chi question, then I'm going to ask you some other stuff, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, Kyrie wants to know, do you think Chi-Chi fits the stereotype of a tiger mom, or is she more of a, like a real Asian mother? I don't know if you have an answer for that. But I'm going to say tiger mom. I think she rides them so hard. Like, no, you're not doing this. You're doing your homework, and it's dinner time, and you're going to school now, and yeah, I think she's definitely a tiger mom, helicopter mom, whatever you want to call it. Helicopter mom? I've never heard that one. Oh, yeah, those are the moms that, like, nowadays when your kids go to college, I mean, you're at every game they do, you know, and then when they go to college, you help them move in their dorm and decorate it, and you're just, like, over them, constantly hovering. So, that's interesting. So, uh, no, I- I've never heard the term before, but now that you explain it, it makes sense to me. I think it's the same as a tiger mom. I just think it's the American version. <laughs> it works. So what advice, because, you know, with, with your, you've been doing this a long time. Do you have any advice for, like, aspiring voice actors besides just learn how to act? Like, what do you think is important to, I guess, be successful and to, you know, in your opinion, to, to just have a, a successful career uh, or, or can you have a career? Because we talked about real estate. And I don't mean obviously you can't have a career. That's not what I meant to say. What I meant no, to say is it's true. You, you, you have other jobs. So is it one of those things where you know voice acting can be like a, just a part-time thing and then you have other full-time jobs? Or you know, like, 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 you know the, the, what's the real kind of thing going on with, with that? Like should they try to be full-time? Is it difficult? You know, I'm just kind of curious about like the industry from that. Aspect. I would say I know people that do it full-time, but on the other hand, a lot of the full-timers are doing things like time coding and writing and directing. So yes, I don't jobs. know that there are a lot of people that are doing just voice acting and making all of their bills on that. And there probably are some, I know there are some, I'm just not sure who they are because most of the ones that are full-time are doing, like I said, the other things. My other things just happen not to be in that industry. I pet sit. I do catering gigs. I do real estate um, and other acting things that happen to come up. But um, yeah, I would say besides learning, you know, good diction, um, maybe some, um, you know, learning to do dialects, um, 
know your voice type. Don't try to necessarily mimic other people, but because I don't want to hear someone. I this isn't for me. This is for me hearing directors and panel going. We don't want to hear you come in and do Homer Simpson. No, they want to hear your voice authentically acting out a part. So no, are you the the kid? Are you the hero type? Are you the mom? Are you the little girl? And that's not to stereotype you, but at least have an, I'm, I'm not going to audition for parts that are 12 year old girls. That's just not my range. I can do a little boy, but not so much a girl. Um, I would say you need to be able to look at a line and say it fast. And so I would practice reading. Um, if you read mangas, practice reading them out loud and do cold reads. So when you go into an audition, you can have the line down well enough that um, from what I've heard, and Leah Clark told me this because she was a director. She's like, the first read is just to kind of hear what you do. The second read in an audition is your real audition to see if you're directable. So if they say, bring it down or make it more intense, but not loud or you know, let me hear some more um, passion in that line. You know, whatever it is, you know, learn, you know, learn to read the line many different ways. Um, I would say you're going to have to live somewhere that does this for, you know, that has studios that do this. New York. Like Texas. Yeah, you were going to say, yeah. Yeah, Texas, New York, L.A. I mean, um, and, and I didn't know until I started going to conventions that that was it i didn't know funimation was a big deal it was just a little studio with eight people when i first started in 1999 so i had no idea um so it it but i also would say don't limit yourself if you can act you can act you could do radio stuff you can do theater you can do boring stuff that pays really well like psas and training videos for corporations i mean there's so much you can do, and I hate for people to just only – that's like me going, I want to be a commercial actor. I only want to be a film actor. I only want to be a theater actor. There's so many genres, and the more you do, the more well-rounded you get. And if you've got your acting chops down, then all you have to come up with is learning how to do the reads and being directable. So I know everybody's heard that over and over again, but that really is the truth. If you – aren't a good actor you can say the lines but your read might be hollow you know what i mean not have as much texture i say acting chops work on your voice tones work on dialects um if you're serious move to a city where you can do it you know like a lot of people use dallas as a stepping stone and then go to la or new york well i had never wanted to move to la or new york i'd rather be a a medium fish in a small pond than have to go and compete against Gwyneth Paltrow and Julia Roberts, you know? And it's cheaper to live in in Texas. It is, and I love my family, and I have a life here and other careers, and so um, I'm really proud of my friends that have gone there and done well. It just wasn't the path I wanted to take. I got a pit in my stomach, and when I toured New York, and like I said, when I worked on a film said I got a pit in my stomach about, ugh, this is just not my scene. I don't think I want to go there and pursue this thing. So it's not for everyone. Yeah, it's not for everyone. And and I'm I have a friend that went on to be skinny Pete on Breaking Bad, you know? Charles Baker did theater with me, you know, in the nineties. And then he did Funimation and then he got some audition from Dallas to Albuquerque and he had a one day role as skinny Pete and then they wrote skinny Pete in as a regular. And now he's in LA doing films and TV shows all over the place. And so you never know. And I'm thrilled for him. I just, that wasn't my path, but that's his and I'm happy for him. No. And I hope everybody out there remembers you got to carve your own path no matter what. And you, I, I agree with that completely. You never want to be like somebody else. Just be you, you know. And like you said, you can take inspiration from people, but not everyone's going to want to go to LA, like you said. You know, everyone has their own path. Yeah, it didn't Last- feel good in my gut. It didn't feel good. New York didn't either. It didn't. Even though I got accepted to the school, and I was kind of mad that my mom said no. I was kind of relieved because when I was there, I had a ugh feeling in my stomach. And- Last question. Okay. 
Oh, go ahead. Don't no, no. I was just saying that, I'm that. I'm lucky to be in a city that you can dabble in every genre of acting and be professional. So I'm just very blessed to be here. But you could do that in Chicago. I mean, in any metropolitan city, you should be able to get professional acting work. Right. Especially in, in Georgia. It's been a big one lately. Yes, definitely. For, for Atlanta's huge. Huge. Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of opened up in the last 10 years. Last question for you, ma'am. Um, first of all, uh, if you guys want to meet Cynthia, she will be at KamehameHan in May. So you can bring your Chi-Chi toys and Yay. take pictures and <laughs> ask questions. Last question. What was your favorite, personal favorite, either line uh, or seen to do in your entire career? One that like mm. you did it and you were like, this was awesome. Gosh, that is hard. I hate to say it. Um, any kind of freaking Chi Chi rant feels good. Mitzi in Shin Chan is so weird. I love that. And Botan got to be a badass, but still sexy and cute. I mean, I know it sounds so blase but i mean i just can't pick one there have been so many for different reasons that i just like okay coach mo not a famous show big wind up i felt it i knew it i live it with my husband every baseball season and i knew i nailed it because i know what she's thinking based on what i hear him say when he's trying to coach the rangers from our house <laughs> Screaming at the TV. Oh, yeah, and his opinions. No, oh, why'd you do that? Or, oh, just hold on. Oh, come on, you can do it. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, there, there are a lot of special ones for different reasons. But um, I have to give Chi-Chi props because she's my, she's my favorite because she's my first and she's hysterical and just all over the place. But then there's Botan, who's, you know, kind of a badass and then there's Mitzi who's just weird and funny and Mitch is a little boy I mean it's kind of like having kids and I don't have kids but I have pets and it's hard to pick your favorite one you know yeah no I, I was just wondering if anything like stuck out to you like in your memory like yeah like you know but that's fine those work for me well okay Yes. Well, thank you for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it. Is there anything you want to plug, anything you want to promote? I know you're not really big on social media, which is – you're very smart. Um, but is no, there anything I feel you wanna... embarrassed that I'm so behind on social media. Um, I'm excited. There's a new project with a company called Sound Cadence, and they have acquired a project that was super famous for like – seven, eight years in Japan. It's a visual novel called Dizzy Hearts. And um, it's about a girl that leaves her home and then finds these elves in the woods. And I play the queen of the elves. Her name is Queen Lind. And um, we're on Kickstart. We're trying to fund it. Um, but it has games attached to it and, and an anime. And um, it's super huge there. And I'm really excited and hopeful that we'll have the same success here that's it do you have a date on that like when that's coming out Is no i mean we we've done the kickstarter and we were just told yesterday we could announce it and i did today on facebook my character and you know that the name of the show um but they've got to get backers and they're they're wanting you know they said that in the past they get more than they asked for from the fans you know, they ask for like $16 pledges and, you know, for that you can get one of us to do a personal, you know, message on your phone, happy birthday or an outgoing message, you know, things like that. Um, but the fans, if they're hardcore about these shows, go above and beyond what the budget is um, needed to do it. So they don't, the company doesn't seem to be concerned that we're not going to get the funding, but this is my first project to work on where we were doing a Kickstarter and it is actually with a company called Kickstart and, um, um, sound cadence is the studio that's doing it. And, um, it was a very hugely successful, like it's a cross between game of Thrones meets groundhog day. So it's game of Thrones -y and everybody's trying to, you know, inherit the throne, but every day it's the same day over only different people die. 
And that sounds like Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I'm super excited about that. And hopefully I've never done a visual novel project. And um, so I'm excited about that. Great. Well, th- I'm excited to meet you in person this May. And uh, I'm sure everybody out there is. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. I look forward to meeting all of you. I appreciate your time.